Good morning, everyone. Ah, someone. So I'll try again. Good morning, everyone. Uh, see, much better. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I know it's relatively early. I know it's already 10, but conference time is this weird time zone that sometimes is a bit weird. Uh, did everyone have a coffee already? Most of them. So I'm, I'm assuming, I can assume that you're uh, semi-awake. So in case for people that aren't awake yet, I wore my flashiest colors that I could find. Uh, this is, will actually be my uh, last international conference this year. Um, so I decided to dress up like a shiny Pokemon. So at least there's that today. But I'm not here to talk about my fashion because my wife wouldn't approve it of, of it anyway. I'm actually going to talk to you about this. And this is a toolbox. And we actually all have one. And the toolbox really represents all the techniques, all the experiences, all, everything that you've learned during your journey in becoming a better developer. And whenever we are faced with a problem, uh, whenever we're faced with a challenge, I'm not supposed to think in problems, whenever we're faced with a challenge, we go into the toolbox to find some kind of tool to hammer out a solution and solve it and become the heroes that we are as developers. But there's a bit of a, a, a tricky problem. Uh, in our industry, as you've all felt, this toolbox has to change because things go out of date, become irrelevant. And to make that really concrete, I wanted to talk to you about Half-Life. Does anyone know what Half-Life is? You can yell out. No. <laughs> I hear a game, but yeah, sure. Uh, the age it takes for, uh, a life, life. Yeah. So it is actually, uh, yes, it is a game. Uh, we will never see number three, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> but Half-Life is actually the time required for a quantity to reduce to half its initial value. So you typically see this in like uh, decay of radioactivity, but you also have it on knowledge. So I want to talk to you about the half-life of relevant knowledge. So the half-life of relevant IT knowledge is actually the time it takes before half of your knowledge becomes irrelevant. And I know that most of you will feel this because the things that I was taught during my university degree, a lot of those things don't exist anymore. Or, well, they do exist somewhere, but we call that legacy that we don't want to yeah, touch. Does anyone want to uh, make a guess what the half-life of relevant knowledge is in the IT sector? Three years, anyone else? Five, who offers more? Seven, who offers less? One? Okay, so uh, to be fair, I can't give you one number because it depends on context and what you're learning. But uh, in research that I found, it's actually two to five years. So in two to five years, half of what you know in IT becomes irrelevant or not used anymore. Uh, I have to ask, in the UK, how long is formal IT education? Like a formal degree, three years? See people nodding, Belgium, where I'm from, it's also three years. We have a problem, huh? If, if your knowledge decays that quickly, then yeah, we have to do something about it. We need to keep ourselves up to date. And uh, when I talk to people, I realized that uh, a lot of people are struggling with this because it's really hard to stay up to date and to keep our toolbox up to date. So what I want to do today is to share a few tips, tricks, and techniques that I use myself to keep myself up to date. And I can nearly, uh, no, I'm just going to promise you that by the time that you leave this session, you will be better equipped to deal with lifelong learning. Since sounds like a good plan. Yeah. See people nodding, but uh, let's go for it. So uh, we're going to do three different things. I'm going to talk about the first thing being finding the right things to learn about. So I may come off a bit presumptuous and pretentious to say, hey, these are the right things to learn about. So I can't really do that. What I can do is to show you the problem that we have right now. Because we don't have endless amounts of time in our lives. But whenever I try to learn something or, or I look at our industry, our industry feels a bit like going into a bookstore. You see all these amazing books. You want to read them all, but you don't have time for it. And in the same vein, whenever we uh, learn something in IT, IT is such a wide s subject and new things are constantly coming. So it's kind of tricky and it feels, I, I don't know, does anyone feel overwhelmed sometimes in tech with all the new stuff that's coming? I think most of the people that are in this session. So 
if you expect me to, to explain to you, like, these are the right things to learn about, uh, I can't give you a concrete answer, because it all depends. I know that's like the, the buzzword in IT, <laughs> depends. But it really depends on what you already know, on what the trends are, and so on. But uh, what I can show you is show you some simple models. So what you should know about me uh, is that before I got into IT, I uh, graduated as a school teacher, high school teacher. So I'm allowed to teach IT in high schools. And I see nobody's impressed yet, so I'll just say it. That's Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. <laughs> Laughs, yes, applause, never happened. Um, so, uh, but what's more important than, uh, than actual the content that they teach you is they teach you a lot about learning and teaching, so like the, the, the mental things of, of how your brain actually works. So uh, one of the models that they showed us that was really impactful and I think is very valuable for you as well was the Zone of Proximal Development by Lev Vygotsky. Uh, it's a very simple model and you'll think, wow, is this DevOps level content? That's so easy. But what it actually means is, uh, if you envision the circles, the middle circle is where you are right now. That's what you know. So that's, all, uh, uh, that's already your toolbox that you currently have. Outside that is like another smaller circle, concentric circle, and those are things that you're capable of learning at this point of time. Because you have some pre pre prerequisite knowledge, you can take the next step in a direction. But if you go too far, then you actually have things that you can't learn or do yet at that point. So because this is a bit abstract, maybe I'll give you an example. And I used uh, HTML and CSS because I don't know why anymore, to be fair. Uh, but it, it lists it clearly. So if you know HTML styling, so if you know if you have an HTML element, you can put attributes on it to style it a bit, then probably you can learn CSS because that's actually moving those styles to a separate file. But what you can't learn yet are CSS animations. Because if you want to animate things in CSS, that's just way too far. So why is this important? Because I saw um, a lot of mostly junior developers burn out on this. They just did not know, and my voice is cracking up a bit, I'm sorry for that. Uh, they just didn't know what the next steps were. And I actually had people come up to me and say, I'm not good enough for tech. All because they tried to do things like CSS animations without the prerequisite knowledge. So this is so important to know where you are in these circles, and how you can move to the next couple of steps. So I have to ask, are there any lead developers here or people in like a managerial position? A few? Well, uh, I'm going to be blunt. I expect you to know all these circles for all your teammates. Because whenever you assign people to a bug or an issue, you don't want them to come back after a day and say, I don't get this. You want to make sure that you understand where they are in their career, what things they know, and what are the good, valuable next things that they could learn to gradually lean them into a project. Because what happens if, if you give your juniors all tasks that are in this outer circle, they won't be able to do it. And it's not because they're bad juniors, it's just because they haven't had the time to gradually expand that circle and learn more. So despite being a very simple model, I think this is one of the most important things that we kind of miss in our industry, to think about this and coach people on that. But that actually only, uh, the simple model works because of a, a bit more difficult model, and that's about uh, cognitive load. Who knows about cognitive load theory? So a few. Uh, so who has been at Simone's session yesterday about Wired, how the brain works? It, it, it matches this a little bit. So there's a bit of repetition, but if you listen to Simone's session, that's a good thing. Uh, so the idea is that we have a working memory. You can consider it like the RAM memory, since we're not really PCs yet, I guess. But <laughs> uh, this is kind of what it is. So we have a limited amount of working memory. And they say that we can have between nine or five new things, concepts in our head at the same time. But what happens? your brain gets filled up with load, really stress. And the first kind of load is intrinsic load. That fills up a few slots. Intrinsic load is just intrinsically uh, about the difficulty of the task. So for example, if I ask you what's two times two, you all say, there's always someone that on purpose says six or five. Uh, so, so for some reason, uh, your brain is wired to give uh, a wrong answer just for fun and for laughs. But most pe uh, in general, if I ask two times two, you don't even have to think about it. Your brain just goes, four. 
So that has a very low intrinsic load. Now, when I ask you to say uh, the letters of DevOx backwards, X, X, uh, see, it's, you can feel it in your head. It's way more load. It takes more effort in your head. So that's the first kind of load, the intrinsic one. It's just intrinsically part of the task. Then there's another thing called extraneous load. And extraneous load actually has nothing to do with the, co uh, with the, uh, the concept itself, but everything to do with how it's presented. For, uh, and you see this, and I don't want to diss other speakers, so sorry. Uh, but if you see uh, speakers that have a lot of different animations, the animations add nothing to the content, but they trigger you. It's load that your brain has to process. It also happens when the font on slides is very small. Your brain has to take in a lot of effort to read the letters, and that's all effort that it can't take into processing the actual thoughts. So those are the two main kinds of load. There's another one, but I'm not going to dive too, too deep into that. But then you might ask yourself, yeah, but Tom, uh, we can only store seven things here. Java is more than that. It's, there's a lot of different things. So how does that work? Well, there's actually a hack. Uh, you can load multiple connected ideas into one of those working memory slots. And the way that works is that you load it from your long-term memory. So uh, if you listened to Simone's session yesterday, if you didn't catch it, catch it online. But she gave you uh, hints and tips on how to put things in your long-term memory. Because whatever's in your long-term memory, whenever you use it, it doesn't take, uh, whenever you use something from here, it only takes up one slot and it leaves up a lot of room for new ideas to form. So long-term memory is super important, and that's why we need to keep learning all the time as well. Because the more valuable things that are in our long-term memory, the more that we, uh, well, the easier that the working memory will have it. So that begs the question, what are good things to put in a long-term memory? Because the original question of this, this part of the talk was, what are good things to learn about? I'll just let you read the slide for a second. So technical implementations decay faster than the concepts they're based on. This is very important, because what I see a lot of people do when they're trying to learn uh, tech and IT is, oh, I'm going to build uh, a front end with Angular, then I want to do it with React, I want to do Python, I want to do this, I want to do that. They jump from framework to framework. But actually, if you look behind the scenes, most of those frameworks have similar concepts. So if you focus on the concepts, then and you put these things in your long-term memory, that's actually way more transferable to new tasks that you'll be doing. So to give you a couple of examples, I have a nice uh, bullet list, which you shouldn't do on slides, but I did it anyway. Uh, so concepts that don't decay as fast, good object-oriented design. If you know that, you could move programming languages easily as long as they follow the same paradigm, but focus on those concepts. Functional programming, good TDD skills can help you in any programming language domain-driven design, and especially the design patterns is a sneaky one. Because the way I was taught design patterns at school was, ah, you use them sometimes. But if you think about what design patterns are, is they uh, form a pattern of how classes will work together. And if those are in your long-term memory, someone can explain a very complex piece of code in basically two words. Big class hierarchy, oh yeah, that's a, uh, that's a decorator pattern. And if you know the decorator pattern, Bloop, light bulb goes up. So these are very good things to have in your long-term memory. Now, I know that uh, I actually expect companies to help you with this journey. I expect it from, as I, I called out the lead developers on purpose, I expect you to help your team with this. I expect companies to make time for this. But if you're in a situation where you're either self-learning or you don't, uh, your company is not as supportive as they should be, just know that there's a platform online called CodingCoach.io, which uh, offers free uh, mentorships. So I'm a mentor on Coding Coach as well. What they do is, uh, it's a, I like to call it the non-creepy Tinder for mentorships. Uh, uh, so basically, you can sign up as a mentor, say I have some time, and then there's mentees that basically have a, a Tinder list, I guess. And then they say, yeah, I want some mentorship, and then you get matched, and that's how you can help people. Now. Since we're in London, I had a nice chat with the LJC yesterday, and apparently they have that just within the community as well. So instead of looking at the 
li online platform, which is good. But if you're local, I would suggest you go talk to the LJC. They have a booth downstairs. They have um, such a mentorship program. If you want some help, get it. Because it's perfectly fine to say, I'm stuck. I don't know what I need to do next. But then, yeah, you, you learn some tools, and now you need to apply them. And you need to learn how to apply them decently. Because what I've seen happen at conferences is people will go home excited, thinking, oh, I'll well, learn event sourcing. So event sourcing is the solution to everything. So I'm going to do event sourcing. And you get these kind of things, where actually we're not making the right decisions. So we need to apply. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give some advice on how to apply, basically by showing four of my pet projects. I know I have 35 minutes left. So four pet projects, there will be code. All the code is online. So I hope that by stating this, your cognitive load won't be overloaded, but trying to give you some tips and advice. Uh, why is applying so important? It's actually, uh, are there any teachers in the room? Some? So maybe some of you have seen Bloom's taxonomy, because this is basically how they ask, uh, at least in Belgium, people to, uh, teachers to structure their lessons. And as you can see, you start in the bottom with getting your students to remember things, because if they don't know what a class is a thing, then yeah, can't do much with it. And then you, they need to understand it. And I actually jump to the top three ones. If you look at the top three ones, and I'll zoom in. Ah, this is, this is awful. Uh, I'll just leave it like that. So uh, if you look at the top three, that's actually what we're being paid for, right? That's creating, evaluating, analyzing. And if you follow this structure, then you can see that before you can do those top three things, we actually need to apply it in some way. So that's why I actually call it the session Learning Through Tinkering, because I think tinkering and experimenting with these ideas is super important. So let's look at a few examples. And a few things that I really want you to take away, because I know some of you have learned things and want to go apply it now. I'll give you some advice on that. And the first one is really limit yourself. Because I know if you're, if we're all enthusiasts, else you wouldn't be here. But if you're anything like me, you actually want to go home and try it all in one project. So you've learned Quarkus for the first time. We, we put that in, a new database, event sourcing, maybe some AI, and you want to do it all in one project. But if you look at the cognitive load theory, that's actually really a bad idea because you're just overloading your working memory constantly. So it's actually a good thing to limit yourself to one, maybe two lessons in the same project or at the same time slot in the project. And the way I applied this was uh, with something uh, like this. Anyone recognize what this is? It's uh, the companion cube. So it's a nice heart for people that don't know it. It's a cube that you drag around. So I decided that I wanted to build uh, a game myself. And uh, let me just da -da -da, set it up nicely. I wanted to build a game, and I decided that Crazy thing, I was going to limit myself to just using Java. Uh, so you need two things if you want to build a game. First, you need to build uh, a game loop. And what I found online was actually just uh, someone that described how you could implement a game engine. And they just listed uh, interfaces and how those interfaces work together. And this is actually really great because I was always taught in university, programmed to an interface, not an implementation. And I could actually choose my own implementation, how I wanted to build this. And it was not necessarily a choice because the blog post listed these interfaces and then said that the amazing thing you see in academics, actual implementation is up to the reader. <laughs> Convenience, thanks. So I implemented it with uh, JavaFX. But what I am actually was more interested in was the physics. Because if, uh, if you know uh, Portal, it's very physics-based. Things fall and so on. So uh, I found something online that could help me learn physics. Uh, and actually, physics are, are pretty simple when, uh, when you go to the bottom of it. Pretty simple in this example. I don't want to insult any physicists. So uh, you actually have uh, every item in the world has three things. The, the virtual world. You have a location. This is my location. It's fixed now. Now I change my location. Uh, velocity uh, is basically how uh, fast you're going. So now I have a constant velocity, but my location is changing. And acceleration is just uh, speeding up, slowing down. That's all acceleration. So And these three things impact each other. They update. So that's here. 
velocity, of course, how, uh, 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 sorry, acceleration, how f uh, fast you're, uh, yeah, how much you're accelerating or decelerating changes how fast you're going, which is way more obvious in English because we're an English audience. <laughs> Uh, your velocity changes, of course, your location. Where you're going changes where you are. And then, uh, yeah, in the end of each loop, you need to put acceleration on zero or you get an exponential gain. So then there's one question that's, how does the acceleration change? And it was Star Wars a week, last week. So you apply a force. The general idea is that you don't really, because uh, when I first started building the game, I was manipulating the X and Y of every object myself, and that the code became cluttered and ugly and difficult to maintain. But if you look at it now, it's basically, oh, you apply a force, and that gets added to acceleration. So what does that look like? Uh, let me just check, uh, where was I? Nope, that's not the one. Uh, portal screen. Oh, yeah, there it is. So I basically set up uh, a small game. You know what? I'll just, I'll just show it to you first, because else. Uh, and I think I might have oversold it when I called it a game, but well, I, guess, I guess you'll see. It's beautiful, huh? Look, I can press the space bar and it falls again. No, uh, so, so uh, what this game for now is, is uh, just a demo because uh, the code looks like this. So CC is the companion cube. It's like the cutesy name for the cube. Uh, when it collides with the floor, I set the velocity to zero because I just want it to stop. And else I apply a force, and I constantly apply gravity. And as you could see, the cube was accelerating. It was falling quicker and quicker and quicker. So if you think about it, this code is super, super readable. So let's add another force, just for fun. So uh, the force is a, a vector, a 2D vector. Gravity pulls you down, so that's the y-axis. I'm going to add some sideways wind. Uh, so that's zero here. Now let's say something like this. And the only thing I need to do now to add something new in the world, some kind of wind force, is to go here. And let's say that uh, if it hits the floor, I don't apply wind. So gravity is a bit of a weird one because you know the thing with the uh, uh, the lead and the um, the something very heavy and something very light will still hit the floor at the same time. So that's why gravity is a bit wonky. But I can actually just do this, and then uh, you can see that the cube will now have uh, I've improved my game by adding some <laughs> wind. So normally, when you do the x and y thing, you're you're kind of in a pickle because you don't really understand the code anymore. But by looking at how easy the code is now, I can easily just tune this down a little, uh, run it again. See? Much better. So what did I actually want to, why did I discuss this? So by limiting myself and by doing just Java, I was able to learn more about the domain, so I could really focus on the physics part. I didn't have to worry about learning a new language. I could just focus on the domain language itself. And if you understand the domain of your, uh, of your system very well, then you can make more elegant code because you get the domain, really. And this is why I don't really like using uh, Unity or something else, because then you're both learning C Sharp. No, not messing with C Sharp, but just another programming language and you're learning physics. So by limiting yourself, you can actually learn more, which is kind of counterintuitive and not what we like doing, because we just like going home and try all the things. Try one thing at a time. So try to limit yourself. Second thing you should probably do is reflect. Uh, so we're all passionate developers, so I, I like to ask this question. Uh, who of you has a graveyard of GitHub projects? See? So my question would be, did you ever like look back and think, why did I stop building this thing? Or is it just rotting there somewhere, like pops up every Hacktoberfest, because Halloween? <laughs> so I think we should really reflect on, on these things, because uh, what, what I find very, very valuable when I tried a pet project and it, it, for some reason it didn't click or I stopped working on it, that's usually kind of career information to know, because that either means that I didn't have time, which is fine, or it means that I really didn't like it. 
And if you really don't like something, there's enough other things to do in our industry. So really, uh, if you do something, have a look at your pet protein and think, why did I actually stop doing this? Was it not fun or something else? Now, to give you a very egregious example, uh, so I, I work for a company called InfoSupport in uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, and they also organized a Java miner, which means, uh, do, do they work with ECTS credits in UK as well, universities? I see some people nod yes. So it's basically a semester's worth of Java. I was the teacher, so poor students, uh, like 36 hours a week, including labs. Uh, but there was one, I, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed teaching and sharing my knowledge. But one thing I really hated was taking attendance. Because the students come in, are oh, you here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, uh, they had a certain required attendance. Didn't like that. So one day I decided, I'm going to automate this. So I took a camera, put it on the door so that the students come in. And then I found something online in Azure. They have uh, Microsoft Cognitive Services. If you've never heard of it, it's basically an AI tool. You can feed it images. And then when you feed it another image, it will tell you, oh, that's this person. But I have a, a bit of a technical problem here. Because a camera is a stream of images. The API would love that I sent all those images to them because Microsoft would be rich. So I had to put something in between to make sure that I don't like highly inefficient and ineffectively and very costly would send every frame from the camera to the, my, the cognitive services thing. So I decided to put something in between uh, called uh, OpaCV. So it's a Java application. Uh, and OpaCV is a, uh, yeah, actually a video editing library for, o for Java. And what the cool thing was, it actually came with a face detecting machine learning algorithm. It came with an algorithm. Uh, please remember that. It's going to be important for the rest of my talk. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, it was 3 in the morning. It was working because I tested it. So I thought, all right, go time. Tomorrow, I told my students, oh, don't, don't worry about raising hands that you're there taking attendance. We're just going to put a camera. And I'll look at you, and it's pre-GDPR, so it didn't matter yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, but all the students came in, and eventually, uh, one student came to me, and this is not my actual students, this is a stock picture. But one of the students came to me and said, uh, Tom, I'm not being detected. It's like, oh, excellent. Not excellent that he wasn't detected, because it's fine, I could see that he was there, but I like failing as a teacher. Not really failing as a teacher, but having failures to show that you're human. So it actually was a, a classroom experience. We got all the students together. We were looking into this together, like, why isn't it working for this specific person? One of the things that are, is convenient to do is strip out everything. So no more the camera. I just took a stock image and decided to feed it to the machine learning algorithm that was not trained by me, important for the story, because this is what happened. So yeah, I'd accidentally shipped something to production that I tested on myself. But as you could tell, I had made a major mistake. This is why you need to reflect on these kind of things. So I built that thing as a pet project at 3 at night because I thought I would be cool and be the cool teacher. But it ended up being actually not that good for one of my students. And the student could laugh with it because he knew what kind of enthusiastic over, over let's go, go, go person I can be. <laughs> but that might not always be the case in real life. So uh, if you take something away from my painful lesson, when you use a machine learning algorithm and we're in the age of let's let AI do everything, make sure that you test it on a very diverse audience. So take this with you when you do a project, really reflect on it. Because in, in Scrum and on our, in our day job, we do this constantly. We have retrospectives. But when it comes to learning, we're like, yeah, tried something, wasn't fun, I'll, I'll just move on. But take a few minutes to really reflect. Next thing is be really conscious about your learning goals. And I'll give you an example of a few people that had to be really conscious about their learning goals. Anyone know what this is? It is the uh, Atlas 
Cal I'm not going to pronounce that because it's not working for me today. Uh, so this is CERN. So does anyone know what to do at CERN? What? Come again? Coll colli colliding things. So, so you don't need a Hulk. You just need a large ring. You accelerate things, and then you smash things together. So actually, the best explanation I ever heard was by a, a Belgian podcast. And they said the reason why they do that is, imagine that the elements in our universe are basically blocks of Lego together. And you can't really see the individual pieces until you smash them together really hard, and they fall apart. So that's kind of what they're trying to do in our universe as well. Now, you need to be conscious about your learning goals if you're going to ask your governments or multiple governments to give you a I don't know how much it costs, but probably millions or trillions. We also need to be conscious about our learning goals. And the way I've messed up has everything to do with this. Because it was the summer of 2016, and I decided... I love Pokemon Go, by the way. That's why I made the shiny Pokemon joke. Uh, I won it. I loved the game, but it was bad the first couple of weeks. It was bad, servers were crashing. So I decided, you know what? I'm kind of an arrogant guy. I could probably do better. Uh, so I decided that I kind of wanted to make a game similar to Pokemon Go, but do only the back end. I didn't care for the front end. Just back end codes, Java. Java could do this, I'm 100% sure. But I made a mistake. Uh, I said I was going to build a project, but I had it in my head. Yeah, but. Pokemon Go exists, so maybe I can just check what they're doing and learn from that. So I said to myself, I'm going to Google some stuff for 20 minutes, and then I'll start building. That was my, my goal. But what actually happened was I learned that Pokemon Go actually doesn't use JSON anymore. It uses something called protocol buffers. And protocol buffers are actually way better if you do Java to Java communication, because JSON is text, and text just isn't efficient to send between uh, machines. So you can actually see from this blog that it's way faster. And what I also learned is that Pokemon Go actually uses, uh, they, you know, latitude, longitudes to have a location with your GPS, but that doesn't scale at all because you can't index it because it's two variables. You can't index it in a database to be efficient. So what they did was with S2, basically you have an algorithm to draw a line through the entire Earth. Every square centimeter of Earth has a 64-bit identifier, and they use that to index it. So just to say I was not conscious about my learning goals, and my wife found me obsessing about this thing with like in the middle of the night, just like this, like, uh, I need to know what it is. Six in the morning, I had not written a single line of code. I was just Googling things. Well, interesting, not my learning goal. So what I just want to say is I know that it's easy to be sidetracked, especially if you start looking up things on YouTube, and there's a cute cat video, and there's a cute this and a cute that. But we need to be conscious about our learning goals because time is precious. So learn from me. My, my, my wife still haunts me a bit with the story that she found me at six in the morning. But uh, yeah, needless to say, after the, the experience that I had with my student, I wasn't really a fan of machine learning anymore. Because I'd written some yeah, racist software, basically. So I did try something again. Uh, and that's basically by using an alternative approach. So we often try to reinvent new pet projects, and then we say, oh, but I've already done that. I'm not going to do it again. But you can build the same pet project in a different language or with a different paradigm. Just use an alternative approach, because then you already have your domain knowledge, and you don't have to struggle with that too much, and then you can improve on that. So you're limiting what you're trying to learn. So what, the way I did that is uh, I built a game again, but this time instead of a cube and that falls down, I made some flappy bird-looking thing that you tap and it jumps. So this is uh, uh, one of my favorite artists, Rudis, by the way. Uh, if you look him up, it's, uh, it's a great guy. So what I did is I need to go to the game now. And I build it in JavaScript. I know, questionable life choice and so on. And I just, and I, is Marit van Dijk still here? Because Marit works at the JetBrains team, and I promised her that I would make a shortcut for the browser, but I, I didn't. Uh, so it will load, load, load. Yes, there we go. 
See? Same thing. Up, up. See? Beautiful game. I did it again. Yay. So that didn't take too long. But I was able to brush up my JavaScript skills again. But then, of course, you want to take the next step. So I'd expanded my circles I was talking about. Now we take the next step to do something new. And I've discovered something. Has anyone ever, of you ever heard of the teachable machine? No? Oh boy, you're in for a treat. So to make the game more interesting, I thought, uh, yeah, come on, let's go. So the Teachable Machine is actually a website that allows you to train machine learning models. Here we go again. But at least I could uh, do it myself this time. So how can I, what, can, what cool thing visually could I do to control my game? And I'm a bit of a nerd. So I have this, uh, this little, and when I say little, I actually mean pretty big plush animal. So I decided this is going to be my game controller. And uh, to tempt all the demo gods in existence, I'm going to live train a machine learning model to control my game with my big friend here. So what do you need to do? You need to train on a machine learning model, which means that you need to give examples. And uh, so uh, some, some cool game design wisdom. <laughs> if you want to control a game, you need to have a, a different state. So I thought that to make the, the character fly, I would uh, train two things. Arms open, arms closed, and then the jump would be a transition from open to closed, so like flapping away. So uh, let's train those. So I have open, and I have closed, and then I'm going to put it a bit like this. So this is going to look really weird. Bye. So, So I'm going to train him with arms open, get some diversity in there, like some the sides, see? Up, down, whoop, 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 whoop. So now it trained 154 uh, image examples. I'm going to do the same for closed. And now it's arms closed, whoop. Get some diversity in there, so we try to build the best machine learning model we can. And now I click the train model uh, button. So normally, machine learning models take like weeks, months, whatever to train. But this uses a technique called transfer learning, I believe. I, I lost the term for a second. What they do is they take an existing neural network, they cut the lost pieces out of it, they put new pieces to it, and they only train the lost pieces because the first pieces of the neural network are already trained. So instead of waiting weeks, days, months, it's done. And we have a tester. So, you got this? <laughs> okay. okay, sure. So, so let's go. Uh, whoop. 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 So now I need to integrate it in my game, which is actually pretty easy because uh, you can upload your model online with this button. And they actually also give you the code that you can use uh, to, to actually implement this decently. So uh, I cut out a few slides just so I could do this demo for real. Uh, so I have this thing. I just need to replace the URL. Yeah, looks good. I need to shut down, oh, I need to shut down this browser for a second because else the camera is, is in use. I really should have listened to Marit about that shortcut. All right, exciting. Uh, let me just, so I have some console logs because I actually log what's, what's going to happen. All right, Whew. Oh no, sorry, I forgot to uncomment one line. <laughs> Live demos, right? I, I tempted the gods and see what happened. Oh, I think that's fine now. Model loaded. Oop. Oh. oh. Come on. Open, close. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> there. So, just to say, even if you hate machine learning, 
<laughs> because of bad experiences, try something else, and sometimes it turns out quite okay. Like, I must say, I've been dragging him all over the world, and he takes up a lot of backing space. <laughs> So uh, try alternative approaches, because even if you didn't like something the first time, you can find something that actually triggers it for you, that really makes you excited about tech. Uh, and even if you've done a project before, it's OK to build the same project in a different language or a different style. But I have to give a short warning now, and that's based on things that have been happening lately. This was, not in, my this was in my slides five months ago, and I took it out and I put it in tomorrow. Uh, this morning, I put it in tomorrow. <laughs> I, know, I, I know Sven had like time travel, the Svenny McFly things in the opening keynote, but that's not it. What I really want to warn about is copy-paste or auto-development. Because the way that we learn things, the way that we internalize things, is not by copy-pasting. And auto-development, I added that one because now, you're not copy-pasting, it's autopilot that's doing it in your editor. Just know that whenever, whatever that thing generates, or whatever you copy-paste, your name is on the commit. If you commit it to get it, it's yours. And I don't care if you generate it or whatever, know that you understand what you commit. Because commit actually means something in English, it means committing to something. So you're committing that this code is good enough to be online. So just a, a fair warning there. So then we come to like the final phase. Uh, you've learned a lot. I've given you some tips on how to experiment with new technologies. Uh, how do you really get the most out of your knowledge? And the first thing is share what you uh, learned. So this is my first time at DevOps UK, but I would honestly be very happy if I'm not here next year because one of you is on stage. And I feel massive imposter syndrome which probably allows me to do crazy things, but I feel <laughs> massive imposter syndrome. And I think if in the right space and with a bit of help, I think a lot of people here have so many, val I think everyone here has valuable things to say, but I just need a little push to do it on stage. So share what you learn. It doesn't have to be as big as going on stage. It could be in the hallway with some coffee, talk to each other. It could be at your office, it could be brown back sessions, but share what you learn, but it because it works two ways. One, you're actually teaching someone something that they didn't know, and you get to reinforce, uh, reinforce your own learning because you're talking about it. And when you talk about something, you have to like, really process it and think about it. Now, I was in another session this morning where they had also a great idea. Hi, Felipe. Uh, so what we also see is that a lot of uni universities are not selecting Java anymore. And that's because Java has gone out of date at universities often, because they only teach Java 8. And then, yeah, universities are moving away because yeah, Java is old and everything's Python now. But if you look at the newest advances in Java, Java is actually a really cool language. has always been and is only getting better, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So if you share what you learn, one place where you can do it is go talk at university. So if you're maybe a bit, uh, have a bit of imposter syndrome from standing upstage here, I think the imposter syndrome will be a bit less when you go speak in a school where you can teach them the latest things about Java and show them how cool it actually can be. Another thing to do is uh, do some good. Uh, I have the blurred background of coding coach. Uh, do some good, really help some people. Uh, my mentorship has allowed me to uh, train some people and help some people get a job in Ghana where they didn't have formalized education possibilities, uh, other places as well. Uh, and actually in Belgium, when uh, COVID broke out, uh, we worked on something called the bubble box, which means something like chatterbox in, in English. And what we did was uh, we saw that a lot of mostly elderly people had really trouble logging into Zoom because it's the login and accounts and so on. So we build a tool where you basically copy paste the link and you enter the link and you're there, you're in the call. Security wise, complete drama, of course, but it meant the difference for elderly people to see their grandchildren, yes or no. And this is the kind of power that we as developers have. We can do an enormous amount of good if we want to. So if you learn something, do some good, share what you know, help other people. And most of all, be yourself. The, the imposter syndrome is real. Uh, try not to care too much about it, because, I mean, this is not something you see in conferences often. 
So just be yourself, have some fun. And uh, I think that's the most important thing. Bring your own story. I know when I was looking at the keynote yesterday about imposter syndrome, I was really standing there like, damn, that's a good session. It was funny, it was quick. And a part of me is like imposter syndrome, like I want to do that, but I don't want to do that because it's not me. It's not how I want to share stories and tell. And I think every one of you can do the same as well. So I started the session talking about the toolbox. We need to keep it up to date. It's so important that we keep it up to date and keep it with it. And I know that it's a struggle and I hope that I've helped you a bit today to think about how do I keep myself up to date and I hope that it's helped. In the end of the day, who is responsible for keeping your knowledge up to date? Who do you think? Your manager? De DevOps? You. You are fully responsible. Responsibility does not mean that you have to do everything outside office hours. It means that if your boss doesn't give you enough time to learn on the job, you need to go talk to them. Really lay it out. Like, you want me to do this? Fine, I don't know it yet. Get, let me train on this for a second. So you are responsible. Responsibility does not mean that you have to do everything yourself. But advocate for yourself. And advocate for others, by the way, if you see it. So. I want to come back to these circles, because these circles, I think, if you take anything away, this is the most important part. Because there's things you know, there's things that you can learn at some point, and there's things that you just can't learn yet. And there's no harm in saying at some point, oh, uh, <laughs> I think I'm a bit too far, I'm going to take a step back and take it a bit slower. I think that's fine, I think that's very healthy. Mainly because if you mess this up a little bit, if you stay too much in your comfort zone, you'll be bored. 50 Spring Boot apps down, no matter how cool you think Spring Boot is or Quark is or whatever, you'll be bored. The ideal spot is like one foot in like new territory and one foot in familiar territory, so you're not learning too many new things, you're not too stressed with your working memory. And the top one, I've been there, <laughs> you do not want to end up there. Because we think by going fast, by doing a lot of things at once, we'll go faster in our career, but that doesn't really matter if you're out for six months because you have a burnout and you need to recover. So take it slow. It's okay, there's no rush. Everyone has its own pace. And if you need help, ask for help to do these circles, right? So I try to help you with these three things. If I leave you with one thing, it's choose one topic, so one thing at a time, and tinker with it. Really go play with it because it's when we start experimenting with these tools and these frameworks that you really learn the intricate details, the nitty gritty stuff. Because at conferences, we sometimes see this amazing demo, and then when you try it yourself, it's like, why do we need to do this? It's weird. So go home and tinker. And I'll leave you with uh, these words. If hours and hours of watching Bob Ross paint doesn't make you a better painter, then hours and hours watching DevOx and never applying anything doesn't make you a better programmer. That's the talk. So uh, I try to help you today. If you want to help uh, me, please uh, rate the session and leave feedback because I want to keep improving these slides because I think it's important. Uh, I'm available for questions like outside probably. And I do have Belgian chocolates to hand out because it's a lunch break. So come up to me and I'll, I can share some. This is not a bribe for the rating. And I mean, I mean this, but I will have Belgian chocolates. All right? Thanks a lot. Slides are online.